Hello everyone, hope you're okay. It's the second Sunday of snow. Miss seeing you here today. Uh, next Sunday, we'll try again. So today the video will be all that we'll have. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining with us in worship. Thanks for your constant faithfulness in your caring for one another and your giving to make all these good things possible. And many thanks for all of you who worked yesterday at Blanche's Closet to make another day of caring and sharing possible here right beside the church. The sermon series I started a couple of weeks ago was titled, How to Be Optimistic in Pessimistic Times. We've had part one, part two, today's part three. It comes to you from three places in scripture. 1 Samuel 16, 1 Samuel 17, and Psalm 27, the whole psalm. I want to start by saying that whenever we might feel discouraged, even in despair, depressed, one of the best things we can do for ourselves and for those around us is to rehearse the stories from our life, from the lives of others, and from Scripture that are positive, good, optimistic, uplifting, happy, ones that end happily ever after, we might say. We do that whenever we have someone we love who dies. We gather as a family and friends and we share those stories, those memories, those pictures, and we remember and we feel sustained and uplifted and somehow we find our way to carry on. In difficult times, one of the best things we can do, I think, is to return to scripture. And so it helps us to be well-versed in scripture so that we can do that. 1 Samuel 16 is a great story. It's one that you'll know well once I start telling it, if you don't remember the chapter and verse so far. It's a story of the old priest Samuel being commanded by God to go out and anoint a new king to replace Saul. Saul is moody and broody, temperamental, without confidence, difficult to get along with, and he's made many en enemies. He's driven God's people crazy. Samuel is told by God, enough of this, it's time to find someone new. Samuel makes up his mind what is needed. He's told by God to go to Bethlehem and be prepared to anoint. And Samuel is sure he will find there a good, strong king better than Saul has been. So he loads up, takes off, and heads in that direction. When he arrives outside of Bethlehem, the people are terrified. They know who the old priest is. They know he has the power to bless, but he also has the power to judge and to curse and to speak God's judgment upon the people. So they greet him at the city gates. Have you come in peace? Yes, he puts him at ease. He's got a calf behind him. I've come here to make sacrifice. So consecrate yourselves and call the village together and tell them we are going to worship. Oh, and be sure that Jesse and Netzivit's sons are here. So the people scatter and regather and they bring up old Jesse and his wife, Netzivit, and they make sure his sons are present. When Samuel sees the oldest son, Eliab, strong, tall, handsome, great muscles, obviously bright, smart, hardworking, motivated, Immediately, Samuel thinks, oh, this is the one that I'll be anointing. And God says, no way. You're looking upon his outer stature. I look upon the heart. Samuel's a bit disappointed. Then he sees beside of that son, Abinadab. And he thinks, well, maybe this is the one. And God says, no. And then Shammah, another tall, handsome, strong, muscular son. God says, no. By that time, seven of the sons of this couple, this wealthy shepherd family, have marched 
past Samuel. God has said no to every single handsome, strong son. So Samuel says, there must be some mistake. Do you have another son? And Jesse says, well, yeah. Well, where is he? Well, he's out in the pasture with the sheep on the hillside. He's, he didn't come in. We haven't seen him for a few days. He's smelly. He stays out there. He keeps his head in the clouds. He daydreams. He plays his flute. He writes poetry. We didn't call him in. We didn't think it was necessary. Well, go get him. So they bring in the son named Dawid. That's Hebrew for David. The name David means smallest of the smallest, the insignificant one, the last one, the youngest. They bring in David. And Samuel sees this kid, freckle-faced, red hair, handsome enough, but not strong, not muscular. Is he motivated? And God says, this is the one. Pour the holy oil upon his head and speak the words of blessing. The people are shocked. There are no shouts of joy. And then Samuel orders the sacrifice to begin. And there's nothing but murmuring and complaints. To me, this is one of the most optimistic, hopeful, hope-giving stories in all of Scripture. It means that any of us who are far below average are in God's eyes something significant something special, something good and great, something with hope and promise, something with future. With God's help, we are all of these things just like anybody else who's great or rich or pretty or handsome or smart. That's a very hopeful, optimistic story. We should tell that story to our children often. They should know that story by heart. 1 Samuel 16, I hope you'll read it. Read the rich details there. Now, 1 Samuel 17, the very next chapter, we have another story that's even more wildly optimistic, hope-giving. It's the story of David and Goliath. The details are fascinating. It turns out that the Philistines who are the Israelites' most despised enemies. Always taunting the Israelites, always picking a fight, always causing problems. They are on one hillside, the valley of Elah between them. The Israelites are on the other side. The Philistines have been taunting the Israelites for some time and the Philistines send down to the bottom of the valley their greatest, tallest, strongest, most fierce warrior named Goliath from Gath. Scripture says he is six cubits and one tall. A cubit is the width of two man's hands, 18 inches and one. So that would be 18 times six plus nine and mathematicians tell me that's six foot, nine inches tall. That is a large man. Muscular, strong, ugly, huge head, dressed with full armor, standing in the valley, shouting up toward the Israelite men, all manner of taunts. And every time Goliath runs up toward them, they all run in fear. Now, we might not know this, or if we did, we might have forgotten this, that in ancient times, whenever men would go into battle, 
Their families were responsible for sending them their supplies and their food. David's father, Jesse, says, I want you to take this sack. The three oldest sons are out on the battle line. The three named earlier in Samuel 16, for Samuel 16. They're on the battle line, ready to fight, but afraid. Little David goes and takes food out to them. While he is there, he asks about the man in the valley. Who is this man? What is he about? And they tell him. And David says, oh, for pity's sakes, why are you all afraid of him? If you go and fight him in the name of the living God, then you know you will win. Oh, his brothers get so angry at him. They call him all kinds of names and tell him he's conceited and arrogant. And he's just come to see them all get beaten and killed. Word gets back to Saul of what David has said, that they shouldn't be afraid, that they're fighting in the name of the living God. Saul calls for little David. And in his tent, Saul has a conversation with David. And David says, I don't know why you're afraid. I could beat this man. And Saul is incredulous. You're just a child. This man's been fighting all of his life. He's four times the size of you in weight and stature. David said, you don't know anything. I may be a shepherd boy, but in the shepherd, I fought lions and bears off my father's sheep. I have slaughtered them in the dark of night. I am not afraid. I am not afraid of this giant. And David offers to go. And Saul says, well, then go. Saul quickly puts upon David all of Saul's armor. Saul's a big man. David has all his weighted armor on him and he can hardly move and he's toppling all around. And David says, I don't want to wear this. And he pulls it all off and he goes down the hillside with nothing but a slingshot and a couple of rocks he's picked up in a stream in his shepherd's pouch. Goliath wails out in anger at the Israelites for sending a child out to fight him. And David says, I will defeat you in the name of the living God of Israel. Pulls out one stone and shoots it at Goliath's forehead. Hits the stone, sinks deep into Goliath's forehead. He falls to the ground. David runs to the Goliath, pulls out his sword, and as was the custom in ancient times, cuts off the giant's head. Announces victory and drags the head back to the camp. The rest of the Israelite men storm forth and defeat the Philistines. In fact, they go all the way to Gath and destroy their city. David is celebrated as the victor. Where does somebody like David get his confidence and his strength. It all comes from, as David said, the living God, if we have faith. Now, later in life, David would, as king, get very serious about all this poetry writing. And he would write many of the Psalms we have. After looking at those two stories and thinking about how to have optimism in pessimistic times, I went and looked at Psalm 27. You know, you and I, we don't know darkness the way the ancient people did. But David starts this psalm off with, the Lord is my light. In ancient times, dark was dark. There was no light. There was the natural sunlight. And there was a light from a flame, either from a candle or a torch at night. And those candles and torches were few in number. There were no street lights. There were no headlights. There were no car lights. There were no flashlights. There were no cell phones. There were no LEDs. There were no incandescent lights. There were no halogen lights. There were no emergency lights. When the sun set, it was dark. And the dark was oppressive. It would weigh upon your chest. It could send you into a panic attack. Especially when you heard sounds, you didn't know what they were. David wrote, 
The Lord is my light. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. So when the darkness surrounds me like a heavy blanket, I refuse to go crazy. I refuse to go crazy with fear. I will not let the darkness press in upon my chest. I will not have panic attacks because of the darkness. I will not fear the sounds that I may hear and not recognize. I refuse to be afraid. Can you imagine having that kind of courage in whatever you faced, whatever difficulty, whatever challenge, whatever despair, whatever time of depression, whatever pessimistic thoughts come your way. Take some time this week to read 1 Samuel 16 and 1 Samuel 17. Drink into yourself the details and then go and read Psalm 27. Read Psalm 27 every night at bedtime for a week. Drink it into yourself. Use the stories of Scripture to make yourself strong whenever you face challenging times. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks for the faith we find in Scripture, for the stories that are there, for the heroes and sheroes in the pages of the Bible. We give you thanks in this time when we face so many challenges. We face challenges as individuals. We face challenges as a community. We face challenges as a nation. We face challenges as a world. Help us to stop our fretting and infighting and to help us find unity of faith, unity in you, the living God we worship. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, amen.